Thank you. You may be seated. <coughs> Mixler has been somewhat mixed up for a while, trying to get their servers back together, I guess. They're on a, uh, I don't know if it's due to flooding or storms or what the problem is, but we're not on live stream today because of that. We weren't on Wednesday night. And they're hoping to have it fixed by the end of the weekend. So, anyways, if anyone ever talks to you and says, well, I tried to tune in, well, I, I put on the website a notation that um, Mixler is, is down for maintenance. When the roll is called up yonder, what's the chance of you being there? You know, there's a lot of people who expect to be there. There's a lot of people who expect that their viewpoint of Christianity, the Bible, and everything like that is correct. And so this morning, I want us to try to get into the Apostle Peter's mindset. Kind of the way that, that he thought, the way he uh, looked at things, to kind of, if, if we can enter into the way they viewed life, we have much more opportunity to understand their words. And there's some passages that we're going to look at here, do a little Bible study, that really helps us to get a grip on his opinion of things. His scope of Christianity, his idea of salvation, his idea of the world. We talked about this morning, what is worldly? What is the world? Uh, obviously, we live on a planet, we call it the world. If we say that there are thunderstorms all over the world, okay, we're not talking about thunderstorms just on the wicked people. We're talking about on the planet. So there's a lot of, it's important that we understand our terminology and use it properly. And if we can get into the mind of an apostle and see how he uses these terms, in what context he uses them in, it really helps. Turn to Second Peter. <clears throat> Second Peter chapter two. And we're going to begin reading in verse eighteen. Peter is dealing with the problem of false prophets. Not only are there sincerely misled people teaching the Bible. But there are malicious, intentional deceivers teaching the Bible. The Bible, in, in the first part of uh, that chapter, it calls them false prophets. It says they will privately bring in damnable heresy. Uh, their, their ways are pernicious ways, which the word pernicious, damnable, and destruction are all the same Greek. They are damnable heresies uh, and they will get swift damnation and, th and many will follow their damnable ways. Or you could say it's pernicious heresy and uh, so forth. In verse 18 he says, for when they, these false prophets, not, not, just, not just sincere misled people, but these people have given themselves over to a false way. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity. Now understand, this is not uh, in ignorance. These people have a plan. Mm -hmm. Okay? They know what they're doing. And even the ones who are accomplices, who may not know the full scope of things, they still understand the intent and are working, have given themselves into that. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure, that word is also entrap. They allure through the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh is, is typically understood as the desire for the forbidden. And it, that desire for the forbidden is, is uh, in every man. Some have been, it has been suppressed and rejected and renounced and crucified. Others, it is in full power, but they try to uh, awaken that in every man. They want to encourage that. They know they know it's down there. The devil knows it's down there. He worked with it with Eve. He's worked with it for uh, centuries. 
And they allure, they entrap by trying to enliven that concept, that, that component, through much wantonness, a lack of self-control. So, the devil comes in here, he targets the fact that down deep in your being, your fallen nature, your, your, depra your depravity, there is a desire for the forbidden. Uh, the harlot told the young man in Proverbs, the stolen waters are sweet and bread eaten in secret is you know, pleasant. And, and so uh, there's, something, there's something that is uh, intriguing about such things. And when you don't have self-control, you're more apt to be entrapped and lured by that inside dormant desire or suppressed desire. It may gain power and uh, get control. And it says it does, he, their work is to do that to those who were clean escaped from them who live in error. Okay, there's obviously a way to live and a way not to live. And salvation in Peter's mind was escaping from those who live erroneously. Obviously, you don't have to escape from something that has no pull, right? It's, there's, no, there's no grip there, so there's no need to escape. But when there's something that your natural man desires... When your natural man is drawn towards something and there's something alluring there, then it's something that you must escape from if you're going to get away. While they promise them liberty, okay, so these are the great swelling words of vanity, is a, is a justification, a license called liberty. Okay, they're promising liberty in the very areas that these people escaped from which causes confusion. Maybe I don't need to escape from that. Maybe, maybe this pull is all right after all. Well, they promised them liberty. They themselves, the false prophets, the false teachers, are servants of corruption. They are entrapped. They are uh, following their own lust of the flesh and wantonness. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. Then he says, he's talking about the false prophets. They have been overcome by the error and they're brought into bondage by their error, their wantonness, their lust of the flesh. They are living in bondage. Now, they don't want to admit they're in bondage. They don't want to admit that they're a slave to their lusts. So they call it liberty. Okay? And they, they justify it. They try to sanctify it. They try to excuse it. And then in doing so, they confuse and allure others who were escaped from it. You see how that works? Now, he explains in verse 20 and 21, he explains here. For, if after they have escaped, talking about the one who is being drawn back by the false prophet, uh, it says they, uh, they do entrap those that were clean escaped. It happens. There are people who got clean escaped from living in error, and then we're drawn back in and uh, entrapped or allured because of carnality in their own being and their lack of suppression of it, their lack of hate of the evil, their lack of hate of the error, and therefore there's this, there's this uh, awakening of these desires and they are drawn back in. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Now what does this look like? We're going to take this apart and talk about each aspect of it. How does one escape through the knowledge of the Lord? Well, in 1 Thessalonians 1 9, it says, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turn to God from idols 
to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Okay? These apostles were dealing with these concepts. And he says here, the evidence of our productivity among you Thessalonians was how ye turned to God from idols. You escaped from those who lived in error to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven who delivered us from the wrath to come. Okay? So here's the concept. People who live in error are heading for wrath. The apostles came in. They gave them the knowledge of the Lord. Because of that knowledge, they turned from their idols, they turned from their error, began serving God, and looking for the Son coming from heaven as the Judge and the Savior. And in so doing, they escaped the wrath to come. In 2 Peter, uh, we have the same exact apostle, the same exact book, in chapter 1. If you're there, just turn back to chapter 1 and verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. There's that word, knowledge of God. They, they escaped by the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Under, here are these concepts. He talks about escaping from those who live in error. He's talking about escaping from the pollutions of the world. What are these things? Well, we know that through that knowledge, he has called us to a life of glory and virtue. He's given us promises that uh, supply us with the necessary components and ideas and power to do so. Verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped, same, same apostle, same book, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Same thing he said back there in chapter 2. And beside this, giving all diligence, we're talking about escaping, okay? We're talking about escaping corruption. We're talking about escaping from those who live in error. We're talking about escaping the pollutions of the world. What does that look like? He says here, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance or self-control. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. Obviously, that is a path of escaping the pollutions of the world. That is contrary to those who live in error. Okay? Get it all clear in our minds so that we aren't saying, well, I'm not worldly. Well, we're going to talk about what is worldly. What is the pollutions of the world? Where do we have liberty? We have liberty to be diligent, to add to our faith, Virtue. You have plenty of liberty there. And to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. You have, that's where your liberty is, right there. Mm -hmm. Now, the word liberty and the word escaped are very closely related. If I have escaped from entrapment, now I walk in liberty. Liberty is where you are when you've escaped. Mm -hmm. But the false prophet was saying liberty was to be entangled. That's liberty. Where they were in bondage, they wanted to call that liberty. They wanted to be liber at liberty to be in corruption. At liberty to be in pollution. At liberty to be in error. But the Bible, the, the apostles understand liberty is when you have escaped from pollution, corruption, and error. And it says here, for if these things, these things that you're supposed to be adding to your life and in doing so escaping from error, if they be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things, the one who is not diligent in his escape, the one who is not diligent to maintain his escape, the one who is not diligent to subdue those desires for the forbidden, the one who is not diligent to uh, 
subdue the wantonness and replace it with self-control is lacking sight. He's blind. He cannot see afar off. And afar off to what? Well, it talks about here uh, the latter end is worse with them than, be than the beginning. If they are again entangled and overcome, the latter end. Well, the person who is entangled and overcome is not looking at the latter end. He's blind. He cannot see afar off. He's not looking there. And hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. He's forgotten the fact that he did escape at one time. He's forgotten that that was called sin. He's forgotten that purging from that was called liberty. Okay? So he's listening to someone who's saying, no, liberty's over here. He says here, wherefore the rather, rather than that, brethren, in opposition to that, contrary to that, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if, the, if you do these things that I've told you to do, if you're diligent, you shall never fall. And in consequence of that, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, let's talk about this knowledge of the Lord. We escape the corruption that is in the world through the knowledge of the Lord. I say that most people have a dread image of God. And they should because they are under His wrath. They are angry at God because He stands in the way of what they want to do. He calls it sin. He calls it pollution. He calls it corruption. And in their hearts, in their the lust of their flesh, in their wantonness, they say, why does it have to be wrong? It is what I like. It is what I want to do. They believe that God is just robbing them of fun and enjoyment in life. Sometimes they believe they are just too bad and God doesn't want them. They believe that God is this, this dreaded God lording over, taking away everything that they want to do, trying to press them into this mold that they don't want to be in. Now, that's what the false prophet is wanting them to think. That's the picture that that false prophet is painting. And the knowledge of the Lord is that this dreaded God became flesh. He suffered the mocking, spitting, scourging, and cruel crucifixion to pay for their sins and to pave them away for salvation. That should cause them to stop and realize maybe he's not just trying to steal all my fun. Maybe there's something more to this. Maybe he knows something I do not. Maybe he's looking at the latter end and I'm blind and can't see it far off. Because I'm just looking at what I want to do, what I want to say, how I want to live. And I don't realize that that road is heading to wrath and judgment, rightly so. But mankind wants to believe that God is unreasonable. I mean, come on. I have a right to be my own God, do my own thing. I, I'm my own person. I should, If I like it, I should be able to do it. And they think that's reasonable. And they think that a God who says, no, here's... You can't do this. There's a boundary. That's wrong. That's sin. That Oh, well, everything I want to do, he calls sin. What the, what's the problem? We think that God is unreasonable. He just doesn't understand me. I'm just different. But then why did he come and die for me? Why did he suffer? Is it because God sees the latter end? He sees afar off. He's not blind. He knows that if everybody followed their flesh just like you, we would have a depraved society like we have. And there would be a lot of... If I want to live selfish and be my own God and do my own thing, and you do too, we're not, we're not going to get very far together. And if everybody in society is that way, we're not going to be very safe. We better put locks on our doors. We better have policemen. But when I realize that God wants to lift me out of my blind selfishness and that His law is love and the Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated 
God's love in His life, teaching, and the cross. And I can look at that honestly and say that's superior. What Jesus did, how He lived, what He taught is superior. He wasn't thinking of Himself all the time. He wasn't just doing what He wanted to do. He did what pleased the Father. And in a society, if everybody lived like Jesus... We wouldn't need locks on the doors. Right. If everybody did that was pleasing to the Father, if everybody lived by the law of love, if everybody gave up their lust for the forbidden and learned to love walking at liberty and escaping from that, realizing that's pollution. You know, you could you could transfer the same concept to matters of diet. I've seen people smoking out of their trach. Like, why do you have a trait? Because of that cigarette. Is that cigarette your friend? No, that's your enemy. Figure it out. Okay? If they could, if they could recognize that that little cigarette, that little, that little rolled up weed in that paper is conquered them, they're enslaved to it, it's destroying them, it's killing them, then they could escape and walk at liberty. Okay? But no, they think having that sig is liberty. They need to understand that's pollution. That's corruption. Mm -hmm. That's destruction. The same way it is with all selfishness and sin. The pollutions. What pollutions do they escape from? The knowledge of the Lord. Untruly understanding God is not just there to rob you of fun. He died to save you from pollution, corruption, wrath, and destruction. Okay? Get it straight. Now, the knowledge of the Lord reveals who live in error. There is a right way to live and there's a wrong way to live. Why? Because God said so? No, because there are principles. God's law is a law of benevolence. Unselfish love. It's the law of heaven. Everything God has ever commanded, taught, or given to man, we're trying to bring him back to benevolence. Trying to teach him how to deal with the problems that his corruption and pollution has caused. In 2 Peter 1.4, he says, Wherefore are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. A divine nature will look at what the false prophet calls liberty. The divine nature looks at that as a dog returning to his vomit. Okay? That's the way, the, that's the way Peter saw it, as it says there in the Scripture. The one who has, who has escaped from the pollutions of the world, and then due to not being diligent to grow in the Lord and, and be partakers of the divine nature, he hears a voice of a false libertine prophet. And the desires of the, that lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life begins to enliven. And that, that, that looks pretty good after all. That's not, that looks like pollution. And next thing you know, they're back over here like the dog. They're lapping up their own vomit. You ever seen that? I have. Yeah, and that's exactly the way the Holy Ghost wants you to view it. Okay? The sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Oh, I'm at liberty again. We're at liberty now. That dog goes, oh, we're lapping it up. Oh, it's liberty. God says, that's corruption. That's pollution. That's living in error. So what's the, what's the problem? My mind. Okay. A mind that, that escaped from the dog brain and got some divine nature has gone back to the dog brain again. The sow brain. James 4.4. 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Why? We're not talking about a friend to the mountains and the trees. We're not even talking about a friend to the local authorities like in the Sunday school. We're talking about a friend to the living in error. We're talking about a friend to the pollution. We're talking about a friend to the corruption, the value system, the dog brain, okay? That's an enmity with the divine nature. It's an enmity with the law of love. James 7, 7. Jesus said, The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, 
Because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. He wasn't talking about the policeman. He wasn't talking about the magistrate. He was talking about the values of that corruption, that pollution, living in error. John 15, 18, If the world hated you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. That pollution, corruption, that, that vomit hates the purity of the divine nature, the love, the benevolence, Okay, these are two opposing issues. <clears throat> Jesus said, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. You might want to ask yourself, who's praising you? But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. John 16, 18, when he, the Holy Ghost, has come, he will reprove the world of sin of righteousness, of judgment, of what's wrong, of what's right, and the wrath to come, the latter end. And when Paul had a chance to talk to the civil authorities, he reasoned with them of what's right, uh, self-control, and the wrath to come, righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. And Felix trembled. That's what the issue is. John 17, 14, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, they are, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. That's what we're talking about. John 7, 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. They call that liberty. Error, do you realize, if, if righteousness is this little narrow path, Anything else is error. Mm -hmm. Error can come in any color, shape, size, any direction, right. except where the path to righteousness is, the path to life. So it's a broad way. I mean, there's options, all kinds of options, religious, non-religious, uh, young, old, anything you want to do, anything. The devil says just anything but this. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. John says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father, the benevolence, the divine nature, is not in him. The divine nature sees vomit as vomit. The divine nature sees that, that pig pen as a pig pen. The divine nature sees pollution as pollution. And if, if you are drawn to that, it's a lack of the divine nature. If you are drawn, if that vomit looks pretty good after all, it's not a matter of the quality of the vomit. It's the quality of your brain. It's your viewpoint. You have the lust of the flesh is more in control than divine nature. And you are slipping badly. <clears throat> You're being entrapped, entangled again. In 1 John 3, it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And every man that hath this hope in Him purifieth himself, even as He is pure. Whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law, Moses' law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sins of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For a seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning that we should love one another. What beginning? Well, it says, not as Cain. That's, that's the beginning. Okay? Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. 
Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. So what, what was wrong with Cain? His own works were evil. He did not want to see them as evil. His brothers were righteous. He did not want to see them as righteous. And so he killed him. And he says, marvel not, based on this from the very beginning, if the world hates you. What does it hate? It hates the fact that you're calling the pollution corruption. It hates the fact that you're saying liberty is over here, escape from that. And they want to believe that liberty is over here, lapping it up. They want to believe that liberty is wallowing in it. They want to believe that liberty is over here. So they hate you because you are in the way. You know, if you read the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, Jesus, in order to expose the error, often just described the straight. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are they that mourn over their sin. Blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness sake. He's saying, this is the path of blessedness. Are you on it? If you're not, you're in corruption. Because corruption can have many uh, different colors. Now this thing about in, again entangled. How does that work? If someone has seen this as wrong, they've repented of it, they've renounced it, they've been escaped from it. Now they're walking at liberty, walking in the spirit, walking in the light, walking in truth. That's all right here. Okay? How would someone become again entangled? Well, in that passage, oftentimes it's because of a religious viewpoint of a false prophet. A religious person saying, Oh, you have liberty over here. That over there is really, that's bad. Yeah, we don't believe in abortion and we don't believe in homosexuality and all that. But, but right here is okay. A religious person draws you back over, wakes up those desires again and draws you back over closer to where you once were. In Romans 8, 10, it says, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. The body, the bodily appetites are naturally, they naturally tend to selfishness and death. It's depraved, okay? But the, but the spirit of life is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or enliven your dead bodies, by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Don't follow your body. It is depraved. It is naturally, naturally tends to death. O oh, wretched man that I am, who should deliver me from the body of this death? Your bodily appetites cannot be the leader. They cannot lead you. All right? They'll lead you to death. Know you not to whom you yield your members, servants to obey, his servants your heart to whom you obey, whether it's sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. You don't yield your members to its natural depraved inclinations. You yield your members to the Spirit of God. He says here, if that Spirit dwell in you, it will quicken or make alive an otherwise dead body. And the goal is, in Romans 12, to present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. The body, your members, become instruments of righteousness. But that's after they're subdued. He says here, we are not debtors to live after the flesh, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, mortify the deeds of the body. Obviously, that doesn't mean to kill yourself. It's, it's subduing and, and uh, rejecting and controlling the natural tendencies of the body of death. Okay? It's not letting the appetites rule. I want, I want, I want. It's subduing that and submitting those members to Jesus Christ, to the Spirit of God, to work benevolence, to work righteousness, to work purity, to work truth, to, live in, to not live in error. Now, can you ever slack up on that? 
if someone comes along and encourages you to slack up on that, what are they doing? In Hebrews 3.10, God says, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, talking about Israel in the wilderness, and said they do always err in their heart. They have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Putting more confidence in your viewpoint, this unbelief is talking about putting confidence in what I think, what I want, how I evaluate vomit, as opposed to how God evaluates it. Okay? Faith in God means I'm going to trust His description and not my own body of death. In departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Let that soak in. Lest you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. What does that mean? Think about it. In Hebrews 10, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promise. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, if we depart from that liberty of righteousness, if we begin to excuse living in error, if we begin to excuse the pollution, the corruption, after we've received the knowledge of the truth, they escape pollution through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So they're going, they're going against that knowledge in order to justify this over here. He says, There remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Now, God have mercy on you, he gave you light and knowledge so you could escape from your depravity. He, you could escape from the lust of your own flesh. You could die to yourself. You could escape from that and walk at liberty in purity and truth and light and righteousness. Now, in this spot, you're in a covenant. And in this covenant... You're safe. There's a sacrifice for sin. It's called the blood of Jesus. The once for all sacrifice can be applied to you. And while you walk in the light, uh, your high priest will keep you clean as you confess sin. Your high priest will intercede and, and you will be clean. But if you forsake this position and head back over towards the pollution and the vomit, you don't have that sacrifice anymore. All you have over here is the wrath that you escaped from. So they are getting entangled. How, how are they getting entangled? It has to do with a shift of the mind's evaluation of things, right? right. Now what does overcome mean? They are getting entangled and overcome. Well, in Hosea 4.17, God said, Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. There's a air of finality there. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. The prophets were there pleading with God's people to repent, to stay, to not go back, to, to stay out of the corruption, to not go to the false prophets, but to walk in liberty and truth. Ephraim had been entangled again. And overcome means beyond reaching. Right? Right? for judgment. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. In Romans 1.28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, there came a, there came a cough. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not appropriate. In other words, the stress and the strain of escape from that. That's error. That's pollution. And they were over here. They knew better. And they began to rethink things and justify and excuse. And sooner or later, they embraced 
And when that happened, God said, let them alone. They're joined to their idols. Let them go. That's scary business. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 6 says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. That's the vomit and the pollution and the corruption. You see the, the titles that the apostles put on this stuff? Okay? Dead works. Repentance from dead works, faith toward God, believing God's evaluation of life, of the doctrine of baptism, laying out of hands, and the resurrection from the dead, eternal judgment. And he said, let's go on from these foundation stones on to perfection, which is what Peter told us, add your faith virtue to virtue knowledge and so forth, okay? He says here, and this will we do if God permit. Well, why would there ever be a problem with God permitting? Why would that ever be an issue? Why wouldn't God permit us to leave the foundation and go on to perfection? Well, it says, for if... It is impossible for those who were once enlightened have tasted of the heavenly gift. We're made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. They escaped. It says, if they shall fall away. And in the Greek, that is not passive. It's active. If they shall turn away. If they shall choose. If they shall be entangled therein and overcome. And put Christ to an open shame. It's impossible to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. After the fact. After receiving the grace of God. After having the knowledge of the Lord by which they did escape at one time. It says here, For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, is nigh unto cursing, whose end, the latter end, whose end is to be burned. So let's talk about that latter end. He said in 2 Peter, Those who are entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse than the beginning. In other words, it says, for if they had it been better for them not to have known, known what? Known the pray the prayer? No. Known the way of righteousness. The, see how the apostle looks at this? We're talking about evangelism, salvation. He sees it as escaping from them that live in error, escaping from pollution, escaping from corruption. Escaping from that by the knowledge, the true knowledge of the Lord, the knowledge of His way, and from there, following the way of salvation, the way of righteousness, as opposed to the way of error. That's, how, that's the terms the apostles use. He says here that uh, after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment. So what is the, what's talking about the latter end? It's talking about the ultimate result. In Deuteronomy 8.16, it says, Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he, God, might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. So, in the wilderness, in life, he gave them something to eat that wasn't what they really necessarily wanted. <clears throat> he humbled them. He proved them. And, you know, that, that humbling and that proving, that wasn't what they necessarily wanted. Unless the divine nature helped them to open their eyes and see afar off and not be blind. Because God is gauging things for your latter end. Satan is wanting you to focus right now. Don't look afar off. Look right here. Right now. Right here. Deuteronomy 32, 29. Oh, that they were wise. That they understood this. That they would consider their latter end. That's God speaking. Mm. Get the dog's nose out of the vomit. Realize there is a better way. 
the latter end Isaiah 47 7 and thou saidest I should be a lady forever talking about Jerusalem and so that thou didst not lay these things to thy heart neither didst remember the latter end of it where is this taking me where will I end up if I do this where are we headed? What direction am I going? Where are we going? What's the latter end? The latter end is worse than if you had not known. Worse than if you had not known. Worse than if you'd never known the way of righteousness. Worse than if you'd never received that holy commandment. Repent. Turn to God and do works meet for repentance. If you'd never heard that, you'd be better off than after you hear it, you acknowledge it, and then you go back to your vomit. All the blood in Jesus' veins cannot save you unless you repent. You turn to God and you do works meet for repentance. In Romans 2, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doeth the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. What are they going to get? Indignation and wrath. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Why does he make that stipulation? He says, With glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. For every man, for as many as have sinned without law, shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Now, the idea here is this. To whom much is given, much is required, right? The one who has seen the light and yet not walked in the light is going to get his due. But the one who never saw that light, all he had was the dim light of conscience. If he walked in it, if he walked in the light of conscience that he had, not having the law of God, but just following the inner moral conscience God gave, the work of the law in their hearts, they will get their due. But the Bible is very clear. If we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing or a common thing you don't have to say well it's, it's an unholy thing if you treat it as common that's what the word means mm -hmm. common or holy a common thing and then despite into the spirit of grace so the Jew had the law if he despised Moses law he had a certain judgment. The Gentile who did not have that law, he had a certain judgment. But what about the Christian? The Christian who knew Moses' law, the teachings of Jesus, the new covenant, the blood of that covenant, Jesus' own blood. 
He knew about the crucifixion of God's Son, the death, burial, and resurrection. He received the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, the blessings of the Holy Ghost, and saw the, the blossom New Testament church as the Holy Spirit spread the gospel around the world, and yet they count it a common thing. Trample underfoot the Son of God to get back to their vomit. Trample over the testimony of Jesus to get back to their pollution. Trample over the person of Jesus Christ, the warnings, the sacrifice, the love, to get back to wallowing in the mire. What will their judgment be? So in the mind of Peter, listen to this. He's warning the Christians in the area that Paul evangelized, modern day Turkey. He's sending this out to these churches. Watch out for false prophets. I think the Apostle Paul maybe had recently been executed. Maybe the reason or maybe because Paul was in prison. Peter sent this. The Apostle Paul around AD 67, somewhere in there, was beheaded by Nero. Uh, most people believe that Peter's martyrdom was not too far after that, before AD 70. Uh, Mark, which was a companion of Peter, is found in Asia around the time of Paul's imprisonment. He could be carrying Peter's epistles from Babylon and distributing them in Turkey uh, is why he was in Asia at that time. We don't know exactly. But the reason that the Apostle Peter in Babylon is writing an epistle to the churches in Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, that whole area with it, that Paul evangelized, would be probably because either Paul was dead or in prison and he was helping out. He was helping these churches because of the present conditions. And he's telling them, watch out for false prophets. They're going to come to you and this is what they're going to do. Listen. They're going to have great swelling words. False piety. They're going to try to wake up those things that you had put aside. The desire for that which you had called pollution. The desire for that which you had called corruption. The desire for that which you know is living in error. Which you acknowledged at one time. They're going to try to wake you, wake up those desires and say, oh, you have liberty there. And in doing so, you, they're going to draw you back in, get you entangled in these things again, until you embrace them. And that's what they're going to do. And you're going to forsake the way of righteousness. You're going to disobey the holy commandment. You're going to embrace that which you repented of or should have repented of. And if that happens, all Paul's labors in Turkey would be in vain in you, as far as you're concerned. If that happens, Peter says, you will be worse off in the latter end. You'll be worse off on Judgment Day than if Paul had never bothered his missionary trips to tell you the truth. All his labor, all his suffering, all his preaching. If you allow these false prophets to discount what he has said, to break down the lines of repentance of the world, the flesh, and the devil, as opposed to the way of righteousness, the way of purity, the way of godliness. If you don't, if you're not diligent to add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge patience and temperance and brotherly love, then you're going to end up going all the way back in the mire. You're going to end up going all the way back, and Paul's preaching will damn you more than if you'd never heard it. This is what Peter thought. This is what Peter believed. This is what Paul believed. This is what Jesus taught. Just because I have an appetite doesn't mean it's a right appetite. Just because I like it, I want it, I need to stop and evaluate. Okay, hold it. 
Is that the divine nature talking? Or is that the old man talking? Is that the dog nature wanting to lick up the vomit? Is that the sow nature wanting to wallow in the mire? Or, or is this the divine nature leading me? If many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We cannot be, we cannot live, for if he, if he through the Spirit do mortify, keep down, kill, keep dead, the deeds of the body. If you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you'll live. I think a lot of people are confused about this matter of Christian liberty. So what if I see someone else who claims to be a Christian and they're doing some of this? What does that mean? Does it mean anything? Nothing. Except that they're living in error. Error is error. Pollution is pollution. Corruption right. is corruption. It doesn't matter who does it. Right. It doesn't matter who's not doing it. God categorizes these things according to their intrinsic value. Mm -hmm. What they really are. So if someone who you really like is doing it, it's still corruption. That's right. right. The divine nature is the divine nature is the divine nature. The way of righteousness is the way of righteousness. There's no collusion here. Right. So you have a real good friend. And he's probably speaking great swelling words. And it's it's leading you back this direction. It's not a friend. False prophets don't always know they're false prophets. A false prophet may be just a ignorant person parroting a false prophet. Mm -hmm. Something they heard, something they were told. It doesn't make it less dangerous at all. <clears throat> but when you start wanting to redefine vomit, watch out. Amen. When you start wanting to redefine pollution, Watch out. Entangled leads to overcome. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Let's stand together. We've entered into Simon Peter's view of things. Has anything changed? It's the same today. Right. John said, We are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Has anything changed? There is a way of righteousness and then there is living in error. And that error is anything and everything other than the way of righteousness. It doesn't matter if it's if it's got the cloak of plain people or the cloak of a Baptist denomination or the cloak of a real nice atheist. It doesn't matter what it is. It's in the vomit category. Mm -hmm. In God's eyes, it's an error. It's not true. It's error. And if you live that way, you're living in error. <coughs> Woe unto us when we start to redefine because of our own appetites. Any thoughts before we go to prayer? I was just thinking, so vomit needs to be defined by a conscience that is being honest with the, the Word of God. And then once that has been determined, it needs to not be re-examined. Right. And the Apostle Peter told us how to avoid falling. It's not standing still. It's adding. Diligently adding on this side. Growing on this side. Diligently growing on the this side. The way you avoid falling on this side. And then as you add, you're, it's not ever going to take you closer to that vomit. Right. It's, it's going to take you farther it's, away. It's going to be farther and farther. The vomit will look more like vomit. Smell more like vomit. You'd be less apt to want it. 
if you have the divine nature. Let's pray.